It's so great to see uh, all of you from all different places. Thank you so much for joining us today. And um, we're going to start our webinar. This webinar is going to be the last webinar on the uh, APA response. It is about cultural humility and awareness when working with Afghans. Next slide, please. Before we start, I'm uh, going to introduce myself and my colleague here. My name is Manar Marouf. I'm a senior training coordinator with CORE, and I'm joined today by my colleague, Tiana Gonzalez, our senior community orientation officer at CORE. Uh, Tiana will be managing uh, the chat and answering all of your questions uh, in the chat while also sharing resources in the session. Next slide, please. Let's start with the agenda. What are we going to talk about today? Uh, the first thing we're going to talk about is uh, learn more about cultural humility and awareness um, and through different activities. And after that, we are going to identify best strategies to navigate situations related to participant engagement challenges during CO, seemingly aggressive behavior and insensitive comments. Okay, so for today, uh, like always, there are some Zoom uh, meeting features we're going to use. Uh, you uh, will, if you would like to, at the end, to um, unmute yourself and participate, you're more than welcome. You can add your comments and questions uh, during the session in the chat, uh, but I would highly recommend that you post your questions under the Q&A section so that I can get to them uh, at the end and, and not forget any uh, of them. And then we are also going to use polls during the session. So we have um, all of these uh, features available to you. Please make sure to use them. Okay, so what is cultural humility and awareness? We are going to start with a question. My question to you is, please type in the chat uh, the first word that comes to your mind when, to describe your identity. I see American. Latina, Irish, Canadian, queer, teacher, mom, yes, person, man, unique, rural, diverse, wonderful. Please keep them coming. Afghan, Italian, American, dad, nice. As you can see here, you're not just one thing. There are multiple ways we can describe ourselves that make up who we are. Okay, let's now think about what that means for uh, the, our clients and the people that we work with. I have a scenario for you about Fatima. Fatima came to the United States in September 2021 from Afghanistan. She has three children. Prior to arriving in the US, she worked for an American company in Kabul as a data analyst. She enjoys cooking and drawing. She also loves watching international movies. Please take the next two minutes to think about Fatima and the complex identities she holds. And after that, could you identify some of those identities in the chat? She's, a, she's creative, she's an employee, she's a mother, she's educated, she's Afghan, hard worker, cosmopolitan, artist, contributor, immigrant, caregiver. Yeah, hard worker. That is all, these are all true things about Fatima. And I find that in our work sometimes, uh, we tend, especially if we have multiple clients from the same country, we sometimes identify them with one eye part of their identities. Or like if we have multiple families, we say the Afghan family or the single mom from El Salvador. So we, I know sometimes we do that because for us, um, it is easier to identify, but 
uh, it may not be the one identity that people identify with in, um, you know, for themselves. Yes. So um, what these identities that we are just talking about, about ourselves and other people that uh, we work with, uh, it, they shape the way we see the world and they, we sh they also shape the way we communicate with others. And as you can see, it, for you and for Fatima, there are multiple things that make you who you are. So as service providers, it is very important to be aware of our, of our own identities and those of our clients so that we can uh, provide best services, but high quality services to them, cater to their specific needs. And we'll talk a little bit about that later and build trust. So considering all of Fatima's identities, will help you provide services that are specific to Fatima and not somebody else. And this is this process of learning about ourselves is called cultural humility, which is a lifelong process focusing on self-reflection, looking at myself, who am I? What is important to me? What shapes who I am? And thinking through that about that through a critical lens and acknowledging that we have our biases. We all have our biases, but it's very important for us to be aware of those. And this means is that what that means is that our identities keep evolving throughout life based on experiences. And the same thing is true for our clients. So cultural awareness means that in our work, we are aware of those differences and we um, acknowledge that our backgrounds and identities and world, the worldview that we have may or might, may not be diff similar to our clients. And putting that at the forefront of our work will help us approach the differences with an open mind and use them as ways to build trust and connection. So now we discussed that how do we implement that in the context uh, that we're working with and in our services? The worst, the, sorry, the first thing I would advise you to do is to familiarize yourself with the Afghan culture. And you can do that by reviewing course Afghan Backgrounder. Uh, it is a reliable and vetted backgrounder that can give you uh, information and insights uh, on Afghan culture, in addition to tips on how to navigate certain cultural orientation topics. The second way we can incorporate this knowledge in our services is by creating a safe space. And a safe space, sometimes this concept can sound vague and uh, abstract, but really there are very simple things and non-costly sometimes things that we can do to create that. And that includes, uh, like for instance, Afghan culture values small talk as a way of connecting with others. And people usually ask about each other's families, how they're doing, their well-being. So when you start a session, it, it is try to have space for these conversations. It builds trust and it helps people connect and helps them feel seen. Uh, you can ask them how they're doing, how's their day has been, how their children are doing. And um, in addition to that, another thing you can do is, and I've, and I've heard this from a service provider in Pennsylvania, um, they know that uh, Afghan culture or people in Afghanistan like to drink tea. So they started offering tea during cultural orientation for their clients. And that is also a way for people to build, uh, to feel like they are uh, safe, they are uh, welcome, and they are seen. So um, I highly recommend considering those things. And the last thing I would uh, like to share with you, the last tip is to check your bias or check our biases. What does that mean? Like, Let's say you are delivering the employment lesson or you are an employment specialist and you're talking to the client, to the, to the wife or both the wife and the husband. And you say, um, well, let's, um, you don't want to, do you want to work? Why don't you work? Or do you want to like, um, like, you know, be employed in the U.S.? And the wife shows hesitation or the husband says, no, that's not 
gonna happen. Instead of trying to sometimes try to convince them uh, and say, well, this is important, you should do that. Uh, try to understand where they're coming from. Why is the wife or what the husband hesitant? Could it be because they are not familiar with the, like the employment culture in the US? Are the jobs we're finding are do not like do they not match the skills that the clients have? Or is it simply that the client doesn't know how to use public transportation, not used to working in Afghanistan? So we would really want to find have a conversation and find out why that where the resistance is coming from and address that. Because as I as I have here, cultural adjustment takes time. Uh, it's not something that like, cultural orientation is not going to change people's uh, minds completely. Uh, it is a process. We plant the seed during cultural orientation and it happens uh, over a long period of time. I have been in this country for almost nine years and I sometimes feel like I'm still adjusting and it's okay uh, because it's a process. All right, uh, next slide, please. All right, so in terms of cultural uh, awareness, there are three things that I wanted to talk to you about today on how to unpack certain situations that you encounter and uh, how to find solutions for that. And one of them is classroom engagement challenges. We are going to start with a poll question to just gauge how, what your experience is with that. The question is, how would you rate Afghans in, in, uh, engagement during CO? Very engaged, both genders ask many questions and make sure to understand every topic. Somewhat engaged, men usually ask more questions than women, or not engaged, neither men or women ask questions. We're gonna have a few seconds before we end the poll. All right, great. Um, we're going to share the results now. 83% of you shared that clients are somewhat engaged. 11% shared that clients are very engaged and 6% shared that clients are not engaged. Which is, um, you know, um, similar to our morning session. So the reason why we wanted to discuss uh, engagement during cultural orientation is because a fact about Afghanistan is that the education system is teacher centered, which means students focus on memorizing information in instead of engaging in discussion. So as CEO providers, we want to engage participants in discussions to help them retain more information and um, learn how to ask questions because cultural orientation is a microcosm for them and in, in their life during the US, they will need to uh, make choices and ask questions. So that's a good start to encourage them to start doing that. And my tips for you uh, related to increasing engagement, you can do so in two ways. Uh, cultural orientation does not start during the session, but sometimes having a uh, work before the session can be very helpful. What you can do is you can give them prep work. Uh, like if you're discussing employment, you can share, you can ask them to review the settle in uh, lesson about employment before coming to class so that they are familiar with the information that's going to be covered. Or you can send them questions beforehand and, and tell them that we are going to discuss that during, during the session, so come prepared. So that way they're not caught off guard, they know what they're going to talk about and they have had time to think about it and they will be more likely more engaged and, like to, and encouraged to participate. The second uh, uh, time or like the second way you can uh, help increase participation is during, during the CEO session. 
Um, and we at CORE adopted adult learning principles as one of our learning methodologies because they take into consideration how adults learn and how adults think about their learning and uh, apply that during cultural orientation. So you can start by asking open-ended questions to, to your clients, uh, asking them what they think about what they're learning, ask them what their experience has been about in the past so that they feel engaged and that they can bring their knowledge and experience into the, the classroom, but also know that it will be helpful for them later on. It is knowledge that they will use in the future. Great. All right, moving on. Uh, another thing, and I've, and I've had this from experience, Sometimes, oh, uh, and I saw it when I used to uh, be a service provider, um, clients get, it, get agitated and emotional during conversations related to benefits. They usually have higher expectations than what the agency can offer. And um, there are ways that you can do to help mitigate and avoid these situations. So the first thing you can do is to is around communication and to collaboratively create communication rules. And that that can look like, um, and not just if you are a service, a cultural orientation provider, but even if you are the like the caseworker meeting with the clients for the first time, I think it would be very helpful to spend 10 minutes uh, talking about what kind of communication you would like to have together. Um, and like, in that, in that way, you can start by asking some questions. I've identified a few, but you can ask all the questions depending on the services you're offering. So for instance, you can say, well, if there's a piece of information that you don't understand, um, what should you do? Or how would you communicate that? Um, if, there's, if someone shares an opinion that you do not agree with, how, what should you do? Or how do you communicate that, your, your, your opinion? And if you, and when you have an interpreter, if you feel the interpreter is not interpreting clearly, what should you do? So by setting those rules, and if you are in person, write them on the board in English, Dari, and Pashto, depending on the language groups that you have, it will help create a space of trust and respect. And participants will be more likely to abide by those rules because they were involved in creating them. But sometimes people don't follow the rules all the time. And if that happens, I uh, advise you to uh, exercise patience and remind them of the agreement in the beginning. The second thing you could do to address uh, aggressive behavior is to de-escalate. Uh, becoming emotional and impatient is one way some people react to stress. And after all, our um, Afghan clients come to the, came to the U.S. under very difficult circumstances, and the trauma uh, of evacuation is still fresh, and the resettlement trauma is real. So if somebody, for instance, if a client calls you and they start yelling on the phone that they have not have been living in a hotel for three months, um, this is not directed at you personally. It could be their way of uh, expressing their uh, frustration or coping with their stress. So what I would like you to do in that situation is to exercise self-control, not engage in similar tone in a similar tone or like back and forth conversation, um, and try to de-escalate the situation. And de-escalation. Uh, is part of this uh, like the safeguarding protocols and again it's not it could be as simple as sentences or words you say to uh, reassure the client so what you can say is oh i'm really sorry to hear you are feeling this way the uncertainty of not uh, settling or finding housing is uh, very stressful so or must be stressful in that situation you are acknowledging that uh, the, the, the client's feelings and you're validating that it is a difficult situation. And then after you say that, what you would like, what you would want to do is to redirect the conversation to tangible steps you can do to help. 
And in that case, you don't want to you don't want to promise things that you can't do. You just explain very clearly what you can do and what you can't do, because we also want to make sure that we are credible and there is trust in this relationship. Right. The <clears throat> sorry. And Tiana just shared in the chat uh, a resource about de-escalation. It has uh, case case studies or case scenarios that you can review, and that hopefully will be helpful for you. <clears throat> All right. The uh, the last thing we want to talk about before moving on to our practice session, our, our section, is insensitive comments. Um, we sometimes hear that um, some clients make insensitive comments. Uh, for instance, they say, well, I don't want to work with a person from this country or from this background, or I don't want to work with a woman, or I don't want to work with a man. So, <clears throat> sorry. So it is uh, important to realize uh, and uh, like historically put this um, experience um, into perspective. So in the past, many of the Afghans who came to the US were SIV holders who worked with the US Army and or um, other uh, in international organizations. But in the past, the, the, the last um, wave like of evacuees may not have had a similar experience. And working with people from other cultures can take time uh, if you're not used to it. So what I would like to share with you is two things you can do in order to help uh, clients understand this diversity and uh, have, a, have, a, have a, a hand in their own integration process. So the first one, what you can do is you can set expectations of respect and that everybody in this country, no matter of uh, their age, gender, ethnicity, nationality, skin color, etc., is respected here, and you can tie that back into the um, the U.S. laws and how and and the personal freedoms and everybody is uh, guaranteed freedoms in this country uh, by law. And the other thing you can do is to encourage your clients to, to explore their city, where they are. And that could mean uh, going to the library, to, to, the, uh, to the public uh, park, um, this, because this will create opportunities for them to create, to make friendships with people from other cultures. Uh, you can also encourage them to do so at work by making friends with people at work who are not from their background. All right. So uh, moving on, I have a practice for you. Uh, after going through these different situations and learning about cultural humility and awareness, we are going to apply what we learned in a scenario. Okay, so you are delivering the housing lesson to 10 Afghans. In the middle of the session, one participant becomes irritated and yells, you do not keep your promises. I need housing now. And then participants start speaking in Dari among themselves. And one of them says, I need an Afghan CEO provider, not you. Please take the next three minutes to think about the situation. And how would you handle that in, in the classroom if you encountered it?
Thank you. I uh, see that the answers are starting to come. Uh, appreciate it. Wonderful. In the interest of time, I'm just going to go over a few of them so that we can discuss together. Um, I see, Karen, a definite de-escalation and validating concerns. Definitely. Um, Elizabeth said, uh, I'd acknowledge their frustration ex and explain that an Afghan CEO would share um, the same information with them. That we, that we understand it's hard and stressful to be patient and it's a process, yes. Empathy, yes, Hillary, empathy is very important. And, um, but the way we express empathy will also be very important. Uh, validate their concerns, respond calmly and patiently with great empathy and understanding, uh, say what you can and cannot do. Uh, validate that housing is an urgent basic need, but housing in Denver is very hard. That's true, like in different places in the US, explaining the situation because it is a, there is a crisis and it is important for us to share that with our clients to, so that they know what is going on. Um, explain the barriers to get housing, who's available on staff to help, encourage Afghans to use provided tools independently and also to independently reach their own goals. Exactly, give them autonomy and involve them in the process of meeting their needs. Great, I see a lot of um, answers and I, uh, in just in the interest of time and making sure that we have time for Q and A's, I'll move on to um, what uh, some things you can, you can do also in this situation. You are 100% right, de-escalation de -escalation is very important. Um, because there is a seemingly threatening behavior here. Um, and then another thing that could be happening, um, there might be a sensitive or like a racist situation happening where it says, I need an, I need an Afghan CEO provider, not you. So depending on who you are, um, you want to understand why the uh, client is asking for another, for, for an Afghan uh, CEO provider. Is it because they... Uh, will be able to understand them more, or is it because um, they uh, will be able to connect with them more, or is it because they just are not used to you, uh, 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 like from your someone from your bag to work with someone from your background? So I would address those things uh, exactly with compassion and with empathy. So uh, what you can do is that you can basically say something as simple as, "I am sorry you are feeling that way." Or um, I can hear that you are really worried about housing. Or like, if you think that they are being very stressed, you can say, would you like to take five minutes uh, as a break and then get off some fresh air and like come back? Uh, it is very important to listen without judgment and respond uh, after being fully uh, um, involved in like listening, being actively listening. So uh, you can also say, I hear you're frustrated with the delay in finding housing. It must be hard to feel, uh, not to feel settled. So these are all just different ways that you can acknowledge and validate their feelings and help them calm down. But in certain situations, if this doesn't help and if you think it's becoming threatening to the class or to you or to um, interrupting for the, of the class, what you can do is you can stop the class of like, you know, and see what is, what you can do with your, you know, with a caseworker, with your boss. Uh, another thing you could do is um, when someone exhibits such behavior, you want to also know if they are okay. Uh, it could be something uh, temporary and it means nothing, but it could also mean that they're not, they need some help and support. So one thing you would do is to discuss, to go back to the caseworker and only the people that work very closely with the client to address that situation and see if uh, they need an extra support or as a, a specialist to work with them. All right. So um, this is just a scenario, uh, an example of what, how you would implement tips that we discussed today. Uh, you can definitely uh, uh, adapt 
based on the situation. And I'm sure many of you have experienced uh, um, like working with multiple with multiple clients uh, in the past, and you have uh, your own tools to make sure that uh, uh, you uh, you make sure you provide very um, uh, like very well services. So. In the interest of time, we have 14 minutes left, and I would like to take this time to address some of the questions you have. Like I said in the beginning, please add your questions under the Q&A section, because that will be more helpful for me to see them. I will also go through the chat, uh, but I will start with the Q&A. Uh, we have a question uh, from an anonymous attendee. Does CORE have a standardized CO PowerPoint presentation, one that could be used and adapted per each office? Our office is revamping CO slides, but thought maybe there was an updated CO presentation already available somewhere with speaker notes and activities, with in-language activities and videos as well. I do not think that we have that available, if I understood you correctly. Uh, we usually uh, leave it up to the offices to design their own lessons based on the activities that we have. Like we do have activities in, uh, in on our website, the active in the activity bank. We have lessons. We have videos that you can use. Uh, some of the videos that we have are in Pashto and Dari now, but they are in multiple other languages. So you can go back to our website and um, pick and choose what works for you and uh, for your office. Do you know of any resources that does verbal translation of English to Pashto? Um, there is a website, not a website, an app called Tajimli. Um, we can post the, uh, the name in the chat for you, Abigail. Let me, you can uh, request free uh, translate, uh, you know, interpretation uh, through them in Pashto and, Daru, Dari and Pashto and Dari and many other languages. Thank you, Tiana, for sharing that in the chat. Um, to keep in mind, when, cultural differences to keep in mind when entering a home, taking shoes off, etc. And how do adults feel when speaking to children directly? That's a very good question. Um, definitely, uh, you would want to imitate uh, what people are doing. So if you go to someone's house and see, for instance, their shoes at the door, you would want to do that. But you can also ask. Sometimes um, we think about cultural differences as something we can't talk about, but approaching that with an open mind and, and ask what they prefer or what they like would be very helpful. And it shows the respect and care and that you really care about what, um, what, they, what they like and what they prefer. Um, in terms of uh, working is speaking to um, children. Again, you can also ask if it's okay to speak with children. A lot of people wouldn't have a, a problem if adults uh, who are present with them uh, uh, to talk to children, but it doesn't hurt to ask. Okay, other questions? Manar, there was something that I had pulled from the chat earlier. Someone had mentioned an experience that they had that they were looking for advice on. Um, the experience was that they found that during a home visit, the husband was uncomfortable with them showing up with a male interpreter at the house when the husband was not home. Thank you. That is very, that's a very good question. Um, you would also... In, before going to uh, the to, to a client's house, it would be very helpful to ask them is, if it's going to be with the wife only. If it's it's important to ask, is it okay to to have a male interpreter, or do you prefer a female interpreter? Uh, so asking is very helpful in that situation because you some for some people they will not have any problems with that, but for others if they uh, don't com feel comfortable being with somebody from the other uh, gender, or if they're like conservative, they might not want that. So we want to keep that in mind. Um, okay. Any other questions?
I see another question popping up. Could you share some best practices in organizing virtual only CO sessions? Well, that's a that's a great question. Uh, do you, Dina? Um, do you mean um, quite like um, via Zoom? Are are you talking about cha the technical challenges in organizing that, or getting the women to participate? women only yes uh but is it like a technical uh, issue or having them join only when everyone else is around yeah um i think that's a conversation if if you can have with both uh, the husband and the wife to uh if because if it is at home and there's a lot of noise you might not uh, you know, it might not be very helpful. So having the conversation with the husband, like you, there will be, let's say, CO or English classes, virtual English classes uh, at these times of the week, and you would need their support. Um, a lot of the times when we are discussing that, um, sometimes people think that, oh, like the husband will be like, very hesitant or resistant to that, but it might not be the case. And just having a conversation will be helpful to uh, encourage encourage them to help their wives, you know, uh, access those services. And if they say no, um, if in some cases you can use encourage encouragement, uh, you can uh, show them the benefits of why attending CO sessions will be helpful for both of them. And um, at the end of the day, if they still don't, you choose not to do that. I think after you, um, you after you provide all of your, um, you know, resources and advice, it's up to them at the end of the day. Um, mayor, focus on women concerns about resettlement and adjustment. Okay, I know this is a hard topic. Uh, we because the oh, the way the way we advertise it. If we tie this uh, to learning English, for instance, and discussing uh, resettlement and adjustment in an English class, that could be helpful or more encouraging for the wife to participate. And if the husband uh, had any like concerns or like you like you might be um, helping the wife do things that maybe the husband is not okay with or whatever. That way you can provide a space, a safe space to discuss what you want to discuss, but also by incorporating it in other services. Um, I have a question, anonymous attendee, we've been experiencing some challenging times around helping Afghan women get their own cell phones. Typically the husbands aren't allowing it. Any helpful advice here? Um, you will find some people uh, are opposed to that, but a lot of the times that's not the case. And in this situation, like why, why would the wife have a phone to make sure that her children are okay, to make sure to communicate with the caseworker, et cetera. So again, showing the value of why this is important, um, it will be very helpful. I had a situation in the past where a client uh, refused to give me his daughter's phone number and I kept asking for it. And he kept saying, no, my daughter doesn't have a phone, but I knew she had a phone. So, and I kept calling him and he would not pick up. So uh, eventually when he came to the office, I was like, well, I've been calling you multiple times and your daughter missed a lot of opportunities and it was about learning English. So I really need to communicate with her directly. It is better for you and it's better for her. And he agreed after he was like, yeah, okay, I'm not available most of the time to, to respond to you. So that helped. And she started attending English classes. Okay, more questions. What would be a sensitive and welcomed way to observe Ramadan with our friends? Oh, Ramadan is at the end of April, I think. Uh, so um, it's just, for instance, if you are in the office, um, it would be nice not to eat in front of people who are fasting, um, not offering them 
uh, like food. Um, uh, and also if they, if you go to their house and they say, oh, please join us. Um, of course, a lot of people would like our offices would advise against doing so, but uh, maybe a, a, like a, like a, a sign of re respect, you maybe have like a date because like a lot of people who are fasting use dates uh, to break their fast. But, and, and that shows sensitivity, Barbara. You can also ask them what, what would be a respectful to, thing to do uh, when you observe Ramadan for me to do. Wonderful. All right, I see more questions in the chat, but I know we only have three minutes left, so I'll do my best. And thank you for uh, you guys for reminding me it's on April 2nd, so it's very soon. I frequently, Elliot said, I frequently run into transportation difficulties with Afghan clients that I'm hoping you can advise me on. If for some reason I need to pick up the wife rather than the husband, sometimes male Afghan clients will object to my driving their wife to an appointment by herself. Often it's not possible for both spouses to come because one spouse needs to stay with the children. What can I say in situations where the husband is very resistant that his wife not go by herself, but it is also important that the wife not miss the appointment. Usually it is not possible for another service provider to take her to the appointment. That's a, that's a pickle right here uh, because this is a real issue and if there is, if it's not po possible to have a female um, like a staff to accompany the wife or drive the wife, um, is there an, a female intern or a volunteer that could go with you? Or um, teach, yes, Natalie said, teach the client to use the, the, the bus system on her own. Perfect. That's a really helpful solution. Um, or um, maybe uh, get... If, I don't know if it's possible through like a, a taxi service uh, to have a female driver, if you can have that, if you have those resources in your office. Um, how would you approach talking about mental health or access to counseling? Marissa, that's a very important topic and I'll try to cover it in one minute. Uh, so uh, as you will see, if you review our uh, Afghan backgrounder, talking about mental health, I mean, here in the US, it's not an easy topic to talk about. And in other countries and cultures, it's also, or it could be even more difficult to talk about. So uh, there are certain ways that you can talk about mental health without calling it mental health. One of the ways you could do uh, that is to talking about, to talk about it as well-being or, um, um, you know, uh, well, yeah, well-being in general. So you're not talking about mental health, and then you're not insinuating that the person is not doing well. But you op you're opening up to you're opening them up to talk to you when you talk about well-being and how are you doing. And then they once they start sharing with you, you can provide them with options. And uh, counseling may not be the best option for them. Uh, so considering all the other options that involve uh, things that people do at home, uh, breathing activities, uh, connecting with friends and family, that will be helpful for, for them to uh, get help without going to counseling. So making sure that counseling is the best option for them, uh, making sure that we talk about it in a sensitive way, it will be, it will help you and will offer you some advice uh, on or um, input on how to address that situation. Okay, we are out of time. Uh, but before we go, I please take uh, two minutes, it will only take two minutes for you to fill out our uh, post um, webinar survey. So please take the time to fill that out. And I would really, um, I thank you very much for participating with us today and for the very insightful and helpful questions. And I really hope that this uh, webinar offered you some answers to help you with your work. Have a great rest of your day and week. Bye.